Okay, ready? Okay. Welcome everyone to the May 26th meeting of the Delaware County Board of Commissioners. Would you please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm Barb Lewis, President. To my right is our Vice President, Jeff Benton. To my left is fellow County Commissioner, Gary Merrill. Our Administrator, Tracy Davies. Our Deputy Administrator, Don Houston. And our Clerk, Jennifer Walraven. Hello, we can begin. Resolution number 22-427. In the matter of approving the electronic record of proceedings for regular meeting held May 23rd, 2022. Salute. Second. Discussion, vote. Vote on motion 22-427, Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Merrill? Aye. Mr. Benton? Aye. We do not have any public comment today, so that brings us to item number three, resolution number 22-428. In the matter of approving purchase orders and announced certificates and payments of warrants in batch number CMAPR0525 and memo transfers in batch number MTAPR0525. So moved. Second. Discussion, vote. Vote on motion 22-428, Mr. Merrill? Aye. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Benton? Aye. Resolution number 22-429. In the matter of approving the amendment to the contract with Cot Systems Incorporated to provide a comprehensive recording software solution for the Delaware County Recorder's Office. So moved. Second. Discussion. Hello, thank you for having me here today. Melissa Jordan, Delaware County Reporter. This is a continuation of our current software contract and I just wanted to assure you that it's the most competitive rate that you'll find in the state and I just wanted to be available if you had any questions. Any questions? No? Vote, please. Vote on motion 22-429, Mr. Benton. Aye. Mr. Merrill. Aye. Mrs. Lewis. Aye. Item Thank number you. five, uh, we you. do not need to address in session with the authorization um, of the county administrator after notification to the board, that one has already been approved. So okay. we're on item number six. Resolution number 22-430. In the matter of the Delaware County Board of Commissioners accepting and approving the Social Services Block Grant Title 20 plan for the Delaware County Department of Job and Family Services for FY 2023 signature authorization. So moved. Second. Discussion. Good morning, Commissioners. Bob Anderson with Job and Family Services. Uh, this is our Title 20 plan that we're required every two years to resubmit um, to the state and the federal government. Uh, we conducted a public hearing. We presented it to the Family Services Planning Committee, and they were in agreement. Uh, we're not changing the plan. It's primarily used to operate our Children's Services Division, uh, operational cost services, and transportation. Okay, vote please. Vote on motion 22-430, Mr. Benton? Aye. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Merrill? Aye. Resolution number 22-431, in the matter of approving supplemental appropriations for job and family services. So moved. Second. Discussion. And the supplement to appropriations is for our net transportation, uh, projected costs for the remainder of our contract year, um, and also our cost allocation when we projected and, and budgeted for that we were under the uh, what the cost allocation plan came in at. Discussion, vote. Vote on motion 22-431, Mr. Merrill. Aye. Mr. Benton. Aye. Mrs. Lewis. Aye. Resolution number 22-432, in the matter of amending the contract between the Delaware County Department of Job and Family Services, the Delaware County Board of Commissioners, and North Central Jobs for Ohio graduates for the purchase of comprehensive case management employment program and Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act Youth Program services. So moved. Second. Discussion. And this, this addendum is just covering a projected uh, services provided through the rest of the state fiscal year through June 30th. Um, again, we're working an uptick in our caseload um, and we're contracting and sending more children, referring them to, to the contractor. So is this grant, grant funded? I'm sorry? Uh, is this grant funded? It, it's uh, through CCMVP is through the state funding. Um, so all the funding we get uh, flows through the state. Uh, normally we don't spend the entire allocation. Okay. Yeah. Oh, please. Vote on motion 22-432, Mrs. Lewis. Aye. Mr. Merrill. Aye. Mr. Benton. Aye. Resolution number 22-433. In the matter of amending the child placement service contracts between the Delaware County Department of Job and Family Services, the Delaware County Board of Commissioners, and Foundation of Love for Youth, 
George Jr. Republic in Pennsylvania, Kids Count 2 Incorporated, Hiddle House LLC, New Beginnings Residential Treatment Center LLC, The Bear Foundation, and 12 of Ohio Incorporated. So moved. Second. Discussion. And this is just renewing our, our contracts with additional providers for foster care, um, effective July 1 through June 30th of next year. Yeah, appreciate you sending out the summary ahead of time. You knew we'd ask. Yes. Uh, about the rates and the youth or the place there and so on. So appreciate that. Okay, you're welcome. Vote, please. Vote on motion 22-433. Mr. Merrill? Aye. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Benton? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. We are now on page 736. Resolution number 22-434. In the matter of approving a decrease in supplemental appropriation for the regional sewer district. So moved. Second. Discussion. Good morning, Commissioners. Tiffany Mag, Director of Environmental Services. So this is a transfer from our 666 fund, which is our operation and maintenance capital fund, to our 662, which is our reimbursement and refunds fund, um, due to a need for additional refunds in 2022 beyond what we budgeted. And we do have this, this amount available in the 666 to transfer without any additional appropriations. Okay, vote please. Vote on motion 22-434. Mr. Benton? Aye. Mr. Merrill? Aye. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Resolution number 22-435 in the matter of approving G guaranteed maximum price amendment number two to the agreement with Rumpke Waste Incorporated for DF DBFO services for Delaware County Transfer and Recycling Center project. So moved. Second. Discussion. So this is our second GMP out of three. We do, uh, we will have another, one more GMP coming. Uh, this one is for 3.75 million and it includes all the concrete and masonry work, uh, the earthwork. Uh, it's at the 60% design phase right now where we're locking in this number. Uh, we plan to start earthwork mid-June um, and then building construction about eight weeks later. Uh, the, uh, the steel building is actually being delivered right now and it's gonna be stored on the back site on the county engineer's property. Um, so that'll begin, um, we're thinking, you know, this summer. And then concrete mid-July, final completion is estimated roughly the end of 2022 or early 2023. So the project is uh, progressing pretty quickly. Okay, vote please. Vote on motion 22-435. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Benton? Aye. Mr. Merrill? Aye. Next up, we have our Environmental Services and Regional Sewer Director with the District um, Monthly Sanitary Approval Update to the Board. Thanks, Jennifer. So we've had a very busy May. Uh, as you can see here, uh, we've had nine plan approvals, which are you know, new plans starting the process. Uh, Burling Business Park Force Main is the first one, the, the pink number one. As you all know, we have that project out to bid. It includes both the Force Main as well as the pump station, and we open bids next month on that one. And then we have Ravine Run, which is, let's see if I can find the peak number two. It's down in Orange Township, um, just west of Route 23. And that one is um, 14 single family lots off of River Bend Avenue. And then we have a few things up in, uh, in the North Star area. Let's see if I can zoom in on that. Oh, there we go. This thing gives me fits every month. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's go with that so we have some apartments there's 240 apartment units uh, that Weiler is working on Robert Weiler off of Wilson Road and then there is um, let's see if I can scroll to the next ones there we go there's North Star Presswick Road as well as North Star section 1 phase B those are both in the subdividers agreement phase <coughs> And then Berlin Manor, section two, is uh, 21 single family lots over on, um, that one's off of Cheshire Road, just east of Pyatt. And if I can scroll back up. There we go. Nelson Farms, section three, this is the last section of the Nelson Farms subdivision, it's 33 lots by Pulte Homes. And then we have Liberty Grand, Section 8, Phase A and B. That one just, uh, I think we see something new on here every month, at least one, if not two additional sections. So they're really moving quickly um, on that area out there. This one is, um, it's an MI development as well. 
And we have Eagle Creek sewer main extension. Um, this is off of Three Bs and K Road, just south of Sherman Road. It will service a future subdivision in that area. And we have Malve Meadows. This is 35 single family homes off of Cheshire and Pyatt. Um, that's another Pulte subdivision. And then Ethos Church, this is along Africa Road, uh, right next to I-71, um, a new church facility in that area. And then Berlin Manor, uh, this is one that um, I think has been in the, in the works for a while. It's uh, 21 single family lots. Uh, once again, Cheshire and Pyatt, uh, very popular area for the, the current developments that are happening. Uh, villas at Old Harbor West, or West Section 1. This is a Romanelli subdivision, 52 lots at Hollenbeck and Old State Road. And then the Cove at Evans Farm, we saw this one last month. This is the, the townhomes. Um, they're actually apartments um, at, uh, at the Evans Farm subdivision there at North Road. And then Cheswick, Cheswick Village, 56 townhome units off of Owenfield, Owenfield Drive, uh, once again in that uh, just west of 23 area near Home Depot. So any questions on any of those? A lot going on. Yeah, it's Is it's this really more a up. time of the year thing, or you yeah. think it's? It is. Uh, we typically see the, the April, May, June time frame, things really pick up. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's even busier than we expected. So that's a good thing. All right. Thank you for the briefing. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah. All right. Item number 13, resolution number 22-436, in the matter of establishing new organizational keys, approving supplemental appropriations, and a decrease in appropriations. So moved. Second. Discussion. Good morning, Commissioners. Karen First, Fiscal Manager. We are requesting your approval for the new organization keys for the revenue loss portion of the American Rescue Plan funding, and this will allow us to track the expenditures separately. And the supplemental appropriations are being requested so we can apply, uh, start applying salary and benefits for some of the EMS staff, some of the deputies and jail staff for the revenue loss portion of the ARPA funding. And this will be approximately for the next 12 pay periods, and it's about $12.8 million. And the decrease in appropriations are to reduce the current general fund budgets uh, for EMS and the Sheriff's Office accordingly, and that'll be for about the next nine pay periods. And that's about nine million. Okay, any questions? Vote, please. Vote on motion 22-436, Mr. Merrill. Aye. Mrs. Lewis. Aye. Mr. Benton. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Resolution number 22-437, in the matter of approving the plat of subdivision for Neverman CAD. So moved. Second. Discussion? Yes, good morning, Commissioners. Lee Bowden, our engineer's office. Uh, for your consideration and approval is a three-lot subdivision uh, that is located on Dustin Road in Berkshire Township. It's only three lots. It's a small subdivision, but uh, a significant subdivision nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Okay, vote please. Vote on motion 22-437, Mr. Merrill. Aye. Mrs. Lewis. Aye. Mr. Benton. Aye. Thank you, Commissioners. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Resolution number 22-438 in the matter of recognizing May 2022 as Mental Health Awareness Month in Delaware County. Good morning. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Do we need a room? Oh, thank you. Is that a motion? A motion? Second. Discussion. Good morning. Uh, I'm not Deanna Brandt. I'm Kyle Lewis. I'm the communications director. So, uh, Deanna asked me to attend this in her absence. Uh, since 1949, uh, Mental Health Awareness Month has been recognized uh, in the United States. And uh, because of the events of the last two years, if you could find a silver lining, I think awareness is at an all-time high. And what's good about that is now we can start moving towards wellness. And that's a big, big priority for us, uh, prevention, education, and wellness moving forward. Uh, we've enjoyed a wonderful term of collaboration and teamwork with the commissioners, and we thank you for that, and looking forward to many years of uh, the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. We do have a resolution to give you. Yes, we do. A proclamation, I should say. If you could just. Yes. Thank we, you. We Thanks for coming. Picture. They, they wanted the picture. Do you want to get a picture? Yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah. We get a sure. vote, too. We get a vote, on. vote on motion 22 438. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Merrill? Aye. Mr. Benton? Aye. 
All right, now it's official. <laughs> Jane asked me to be brief, so I'm done. Oh, oh. <laughs> we always follow Jane. That's right, Jane's a good Item number 16, our health commissioner has a health district update for Delaware Public Health. Well, good morning, commissioners. I have to tell you, this is a beautiful space. I haven't had the opportunity to be here, so absolutely gorgeous and very commendable for all the restoration work that you've done. Sheila Heddleson, your health commissioner, it's been a little while since I've had the opportunity to come and let you kind of know the state of the health district. Um, we don't always have as much information to share as you all do to do a whole county state of the health district. So just to share with you a few things that are going on, I'm going to kind of start with big picture public health and then move a little bit more to some of what we're doing here in the county. So uh, big picture public health, uh, during COVID, we were reaccredited. Uh, very, very proud of that. Reaccreditation for public health um, in Ohio is mandated. We're the only state in um, the count in the country that requires mandated uh, public health accreditation. And what that really means to our community is, is that there is a national set, set of quality standards that are program focused and evidence based and your health district is meeting every single one of those. So we're very, very proud oh, that's of great. that. great. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. We actually didn't even celebrate when it happened. So someday we'll celebrate it probably when we get reaccredited the next time. So um, that's the first thing. I uh, wanted to also share with you that um, we're very well aware of House Bill 463 and know that there is a, um, a representative down in Southern Ohio, uh, Jason Stevens, that's looking to dissolve the District Advisory Council. And I know that CCAO has not taken an opinion on it because apparently across the state there are varying opinions. So um, the premise of the bill is really looking at accountability and transparency for health districts and maybe there's a better way to do that um, aside from the district advisory council so i just wanted to bring that up and uh, talk to you all a little bit and see if you all have any concerns um, as Commissioner uh, Merrill knows that we, he was just at our March meeting, which is required every year. We're actually getting ready to have another one because we have another Board of Health member that needs to be appointed. Um, but we have 26 political subdivisions in the county and 25 were there. And so I think one of the reasons that this particular representative introduced this is in his area, they have a very difficult time getting the District Advisory Council together and their ability to even have a meeting to appoint the Board of Health members which you all recall is that's the purpose of the District Advisory Council. So just wanted to kind of throw that out there, see if there were any questions or anything that you had. As far as transparency for your health district, we do post all of our <coughs> meeting minutes, meetings agendas, all of our fiscal information is posted on our website. You all do receive our newsletters that Ms. Whitaker is here with me today, um, provides to you quarterly those do uh, meet the requirements that the ORC has for what we are required to report to the District Advisory Council. And then of course, we do ours usually monthly. For a while we were doing them weekly to make sure that our community is aware of everything that's going on. But I didn't know if there were any particular questions or concerns that you all have of the transparency and the accountability for the Health District. Uh, Sheila, on that legislation, what would be the replacement of the district? Well, it, it's very interesting that you asked that question because the, um, the bill actually makes the county commissioners in charge of appointing the Board of Health members. And of course, the District Advisory Council, which is made up of one county commissioner, all of the township trustee presidents, and then the mayors are the administrators of all of our municipalities. Um, all of those subdivisions actually provide some monetary support to the health district. And you all know the county commissioners as a whole don't provide that monetary support. And so I think that that's one of the other issues that keeps coming up. And so my association, the Association of Ohio Health Commissioners, is working very closely with the representative who introduced the bill and he is well aware that this isn't probably the best 
method to maybe make this happen in those areas of the state where they're having some difficulty. So we've actually introduced to him several things that we think would be maybe better things that would uh, maybe increase that accountability and that transparency. Um, very good idea to look at all of these rules and laws. Most of the rules and laws that govern public health were put into place in 1919. That's a really long time to have the same rules and regulations. So just like during COVID when we had um, lots of different things come up with the legislature related to those rules and laws, it's a great idea to look at all of those. And in fact, my association, the Association of Ohio Health Commissioners, in 2012, we actually put a futures paper together and looked at all of those things and all of the modernization, or as our speaker this last week called it, a renaissance, all of those things that really need to look, be looked at, both at not just state public health, but national public health. And we know that there are lots of things, particularly around data, that truly need to be improved so that we as a health district do have the ability to get real-time data to respond to whatever the issue happens to be. In Ohio, there are over 20 200 systems that we all have to enter data and find data in in order to be able to do parts of our jobs. And we still, to this day, get faxes um, when we get uh, communicable disease reports. So that's part of the impetus behind it, I think. And he realizes that this is probably not the perfect way to do this. So we've actually um, given him some different ideas for other things that maybe might be helpful. One of the recommendations is to allow the fiscal officers of the townships or the cities um, or the villages to sit on the district advisory council instead of just the trustees. If there's a concern about the fiscal accountability, that might be a really good person. One of the things we've also suggested is that there be a requirement that all um, fiscal officers of health districts require a certain amount of training or a certification. Now, we're very fortunate. Um, Dawn uh, Hall, who many of you probably know from her time at the um, auditor's office, she just actually received her governmental accounting certification. And so we're very well prepared here in Delaware County, but that is not the case across the state. Good. Any mm -hmm. questions about your They're health district? Very interesting. I wasn't aware of the bill. Well, <laughs> I'm on the policy committee. This was discussed last week. CCOA is not making a recommendation at this exactly. time. However, uh, I think there are concerns, and I think some legitimate concerns about the current makeup, and I don't want to go into details, but uh, uh, because I'm one of a number of members, and uh, we're, but just basically a dialogue, that's all it was, and I think some of the concerns you share, we share. I, I would say that the commissioners have a number of boards we serve on, we, we appoint to, that we have no revenue responsibility to, so that is not by itself unique. I'm not saying it's a good idea or a bad idea, but, and I think we've done a pretty good job in Delaware County of trying to provide that quality of leadership. Uh, so neither good or bad, I'm just saying there are precedents for that in other areas, so just an FYI. Uh, but at this point, CCO is not taking a position. Uh, there was just a conversation, a dialogue, and uh, input from a number of members had different perspectives, but uh, I think the bill in its current form uh, CCO probably the, at least the policy committee also has some concerns so thank you yes yeah. and that's actually what we've been told is that there is no opinion and even the representative who um, submitted it said really a placeholder to look at the issue and see if there are better ways or different things that we could do what I wanted to share with you and I do have some handouts that I'll leave for you one of the things that we do that is certainly above and beyond the requirements that we do as a health district is we really do look at all of our funding that we receive, whether it's discretionary or non-discretionary. And of course, I always tell everybody, it's all discretionary or non-discretionary funding because they're taxpayers' dollars and we have to be very accountable. But one of the things that we really look at is how do we spend our money, not only the money that we get maybe in funds or grants, fees or grants, but how do we spend our levy dollars and where do those dollars go for our community to be able to look to see where do we spend those. And so there's a concept, and it's a national concept, which actually Ohio has been one of the leaders in, is the foundational public health services. And basically, this is um, all of our residents in our country ought to be able to expect this certain level. There are nine things like communicable disease, emergency preparedness, um, epidemiology, some of those things, those foundational services. And then we look at the next level of services are called areas, and those services are those things that are mandated by the state of Ohio. 
funded or not, because we have lots of unfunded mandates, just as all of you all do. Um, and then there's kind of the above the line things that maybe your community requires of you. But we try to look at those, our funding in relation to that, because of course, most of those foundational capabilities, there's no funding source for, and that is what our levy in Ohio, most of the health districts, that's what our funding goes to. Now theoretically, in an ideal world, the, the funding for those basic public health services would come from the federal government, those state required um, resources would come from the state, and then only our local dollars would be required for those things that the local community needs us to do. And in Ohio it is completely backwards. Um, we get 34 cents per capita um, to take care of all of the public health needs for our community. And to put that a little bit in perspective, in Pennsylvania it's over $4 per capita. Part of this work that we do with the Foundational Public Health Services is we do this as a statewide project also because in working with the legislature for the last 10, 15 years, one of the questions that we always get asked is, well, how much funding do you need and what do you need the funding for? Um, obviously, again, that 17 cents has been in law for many, 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 many years, but what do we need to do? And so one of the things that we're able to do with looking at this reporting, and the report that I give to my board, other health districts don't do. I do this a little bit more in depth for them, and I'm going to give you a copy of that. But what we found in doing this over the last four years and having this data analyzed um, at the university level is in order for truly all of those foundational capabilities to be met in the state of Ohio, that per capita would have to be $10.85. And we're sitting at 17 or 34. We do get 34 cents here in Delaware because we are nationally accredited. And so they did double that. So just to share that with you, I think it's, um, Interesting information for you all to know where we spend the money that we get, and particularly for our community to know where we get the money that we spend. The only other caveat I will add about that is we do have a line that's called infrastructure, and you will see that that's where all of our levy dollars and things come into that line. And when you look at that, and you, I, we don't want folks to think, well, that's administration, because that's not administration. That's not my salary and the, the salary of our directors or anything. That truly is our HR services, our IT, our building, you know, all of those foundational things that we have to have as a health district in order to be able to provide the services that we do. So that's just kind of big picture public health I wanted to share with you. Um, you are probably aware that Robert Wood Johnson, again, made us number one in the state for health factors and health outcomes. And of course, we always say we're so proud of that. And I know whenever the county gets or recognition of being number one in anything, we all kind of go, woohoo, yay for us. It is isn't just the health district though, it truly is just as Kyle just mentioned, it's the partnership that we have as a community and working together um, for the benefit of all of our residents, not just the ones who live in one city or one other political subdivision, but all the way across. So that's another woohoo, we're very proud of that. Um, our overdoses, um, Kyle just mentioned mental health. I do have our overdose report from you for you from 2020. I had the opportunity this week to sit with Congressman Balderson and uh, Congressman Kevin McCarthy on a round table down in Columbus to really look at the opioids and fentanyl and what is this doing to our state and to our country as a whole. And I would just share with you that in 2020, um, we had 30 total overdose deaths and 25 of those were um, had fentanyl involved. Our 2021 preliminary data is 39, with 30 of those having fentanyl. And then our preliminary 20 to 20, 2022 data, we've already had seven overdose deaths and five of those have fentanyl related. And so obviously a huge problem. And you know, we at the Health District, we do have the naloxone program that is funded through the Ohio Department of Health. It is not levy dollars. We get asked that a lot. Um, it is funded through the Ohio Department of Health. But besides just giving the kids, it's giving that education to friends and family members so that they do have that life-saving resource available to them if they are somewhere where someone overdoses on Closing the border would be helpful too. Pardon me? Closing the southern border would be helpful as well. That is actually, that's what the whole round table was about on um, Tuesday that I sat in on. But, you know, looking at it from a public health standpoint, we try to also look at the, the prevention and then what can we do. And, and I did say to uh, the leader that obviously if we could get rid of the fentanyl, that would help us a whole lot, right? And all of the drugs. So closing that certainly would be helpful. Um, wanted to also share with you that the community health assessment as an accredited health district we are required to 
to do that every five years. So the health assessment was just completed in the fall of last year. We just released all of that data uh, May 18th, so it's hot off the presses. In some areas, we did a little bit better. In some areas, we did a little bit worse. And certainly because our, our previous health assessment it was five years ago, you know, you would expect that there would be some changes. And so the next steps with that is to develop the new community health improvement plan, which will start uh, January of 2023. It'll be a six-year plan. If any of you are interested, you should be receiving information about what's going on with that, but if you're interested in participating in any of those, the Partnership for a Healthy Delaware County will be looking at all of that data now and then determining what our priorities for the next six years are going to be. And think that's all. Last but not least, certainly, um, you know, we have to think just a little bit of COVID. Um, our numbers are certainly way down to where they were, although they are headed up a little bit. But the good news is, is our community still is very highly vaccinated. Hopefully, people are having those conversations with their physician and making those decisions based on their health and the health of their families. Um, and we are not seeing that huge rise in hospitalizations and or deaths. And so that's good. We know that COVID's probably going to be around. Um, I actually was just invited to participate with the Ohio Department of Health to make the change from COVID being a Class A reportable disease to being a Class B reportable disease. We're not there yet, but looking at what do we need to be, what are those metrics that we need to meet in order to make it that way. Um, I think it's going to be like flu. It's something we're probably going to live with. Um, and then just encouraging people to make those decisions with their physician about what is best for them and their families. So I think that those are my major updates, and I'd be happy to answer any you, up? you want to share anything with us for your new facility? Do you want to mention Our that? Our new again? facility, oh gosh, our new facility. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you don't. <laughs> you know, we were supposed to have been in in the in the spring of 2021, and then it was the fall of 2021, and then it was the spring of this year, and now it's the fall of this year. They're just having lots and lots of issues with getting contractors, um, getting supplies. Our biggest supply is we are building a metal building is the main frame. Of course, there's the brick on it that's required by the city. Um, and just getting that metal framing was so far behind. That's probably the biggest hiccup. Now we have all of the supplies, but our the um, contractor can't get the staff that they need to do the work that needs to be done. So it's very disheartening. I think our staff um, have been through a lot. Um, I'm so proud of our team. We have just such an amazing team that persevered, and we were sh talking earlier about, you know, institutions that completely closed their doors during all of this or, um, you know, didn't provide services, and we were there every day, seven days a week, 12 hours most days, um, providing the services that our community needed. And I was really looking forward to letting them move into a new building. Not that the building is the reward for all the work that they've done, but what a nice thing to be able to have a new facility that meets the needs, but even more so meets the needs of our community by having parking that our young mothers with the strollers and the babies and all of these things can drive right up to the door and walk right in. So right now the plan is this fall. Um, Mr. Blaney, who I know many of you know, he's our board president. Um, he tells me not to hold my breath, and I keep saying, but I have oh. to hope. I have to hope. Yeah. So that's where we are with our new facility. Any other questions, comments? Uh, thank you, Sheila. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you so much, well, and welcome. thank you. Your communication has been excellent on COVID and, and, uh, and all the other <laughs> diseases. And uh, um, boy, I mean, you've been through. You've, really done a terrific job after Thank having you. gone through so much well, and it is certainly so a much. partnership our law enforcement the sheriff's office our ems you know we just couldn't have done all of this without those partners our schools have been great to work with so oh, it you. truly is a partnership and we're very pleased to live in the county um, when i talked to some of my peers that was not the case across the state and so we're just very fortunate here in Delaware County that we know each other and we knew each other before all of this started, so we weren't making introductions um, right as it started. That's right. so that's I will leave copies of some of okay. these things for you all, and then there's a copy for your record. Okay, well. thank you thank so you. much. Great report. Next would be administrator reports. 
Good morning, commissioners. Just wanted to mention that I participated on a MORPSI subcommittee meeting yesterday. It was an interregional connections committee. And uh, it's really talking about um, transportation projects that would go through multiple regions. One of the main focuses right now is particularly on passenger rail. There's a federal funding out there for additional um, rail services and Amtrak has committed to creating over 30 new routes over the next 15 years. One of them would potentially be the 3C corridor from Cincinnati to Columbus to Cleveland, and one of those stops would be in Delaware County. So we're working as a team, keeping um, an eye on that, talking about different things that we might do, and then we would make a recommendation, if needed, to the Transportation Advisory Committee of Morpsey. So. I think we meet on a quarterly basis, and I'll keep you updated. That's all I have. Great. And I have nothing to report today. Commissioner Ben? Uh, really, just uh, we had land bank meeting <coughs> Tuesday. We got regional planning tonight. That's about all I got. Commissioner Mayor? Uh, we're approaching a holiday that uh, I think sometimes you forget the real purpose of this holiday, and that is to uh, acknowledge and remind ourselves those who have given it all for the for us for the freedoms we have today and uh, Memorial Day is a day that uh, we hope we all take a deep breath maybe close our eyes and just think about those who have sacrificed it all for us and uh, um, it's so easy to forget and uh, unfortunately in today's world I think many do not make that connection so please think about that and that's all I have uh, that's, a, that's a good point about uh, remembering Memorial Day and those, you're right, who have given their all for our freedom and, and uh, oh, it's great when you see those flags flying in front of people's homes and uh, God bless America. I, mean, I did attend the uh, Central Ohio Senior Citizens Hall of Fame. Uh, we had two honorees there and uh, who, and and uh, they are the Mortons, Donna and Walter Morton. And uh, there were some other great awardees too. And it's, it's all a, such an uplifting uh, ceremony. And 11, 11 uh, couples were, were, either couples or singular people were honored from, uh, um, from each county. So anyway. Um, Next up is our community enhancement presentations. I don't know if you're ready to start right into that or if you needed a brief recess. Or... Um, we don't have anything listed for executive. We do not have anything listed for executive session. Oh, okay. I'd say we go into the, uh, we'll go into the um, community enhancement grants. Okay. Shall I go? <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me in this morning. I appreciate the opportunity to tell you about our park. Uh, my name is Roxanne Amadon. I'm the director of Boardman Arts Park. Just want to spend a couple of minutes orienting you to the park in case you weren't familiar. 
It's just three or four blocks away from here, here between William and Winter Street um, on the other side of Liberty. Um, it's a green space that's owned by the school district, the Delaware City School District. Um, it was the site of an elementary school, Wardman, and before that, West School, and then the Willis Playfield. Um, in 2017, the Neighborhood Association came together, and as the school district was not going to be using the space anymore, and our mission was to try to save that space as a downtown green space. We don't have a lot. We'd like to have more. In 2019, we established the Boardman Arts Park uh, 501c3 so that we could apply for grants and have more significant impact and entered into an ongoing lease with the school district. Our mission is to make it an outdoor art gallery or to have it become or continue to be now an outdoor art gallery and an event venue um, here in the downtown area. It is community funded through grants, um, donations, uh, in-kind donations as well as cash and it's volunteer run. We have over 100 pieces of art at the park. Um, it is certainly um, evolving all the time because it's an outside space. It tends to need to be refreshed. Um, it, these pieces are 95% developed in uh, Delaware County. We have some pieces from Columbus and even some from Nigeria, which we'll talk about in a moment. But um, we've uh, invited every school district and they've provided pieces of art and community groups like Creative Foundation, Source Point. We try to reach out into the community and bring them in and engage them in a variety of ways. We have ongoing events such as classes um, that are held at the park. We have free community programming and festivals that are um, fundraisers for us as well. So those festivals can have you know, a couple hundred people. Um, and last year we had um, our, after COVID, our first um, artisan festival that had almost 2,500 people there. So we're excited. We're continuing to grow. And this year we have a full slate of activities, three free community programs and three fundraising festivals. Um, and the Create event is a free community event where we'll be creating collaborative art and putting it in the park is something that the community can enjoy. Um, our long-term vision is to develop the space fully. Uh, we're going to talk more about the imagination space, and that's what we're here to ask for assistance with today. Um, that is the interactive art space. Um, we have a pavilion in the center that's kind of a, a calming respite. Uh, a, an Eagle Scout troop put up a hammock pavilion, and so that's a very popular location for people to hang out and read and swing their children. We have the vision of putting a performance platform in and are talking to some artists about an artistic performance platform. We'd like to ultimately put in a four season building and some parking. It's a lot to do in two little acres and on a volunteer team, but we tend to do it. Um, the imagination space, the intention for that space is to be an interactive art gallery so that the art is touchable and interactive for children and families. Um, we would have it a small performance area, a walking path, seating, an art maze, water feature, etc. cetera. Um, it was formerly the space of 12 basketball courts that were kind of broken up. We have, those have since been excavated away. This is a vision, or this is a, a picture of our current walking paths some of our sculptures and gardens that are there, a gazebo that was donated. Um, and so you can see the, the type of feel it will have. Ultimately, this is what the space would look like. We do have a performance stage that was donated. We do have the gazebo. To your left is, the, uh, is Winter Street. Um, and to your right would be the, the larger area. Um, the yellow um, bits are stars are where we added spaces last year in 2021, a wildflower maze and a couple of art pieces. <clears throat> the, um, so here is a picture of the new entrance that we commissioned with some grant money from the Ohio Arts Council. Um, it's wrought iron and it kind of has a, a little homage to our uh, logo, so a little whimsy to it as well. 
We added some interactive art pieces, bucket head. You spin his wheel and his head spins around. Um, so he's a, our first interactive, real interactive piece. There's also a gnome village. Um, and then our, um, our 10 foot long, six foot high unicorn arrived from Lagos, Nigeria last summer. He was also commissioned through the Ohio Arts Council. And there's Commissioner Benton at the unveiling. Ta-da. Um, so that was a lot of fun, and it, that is a very active picture spot at the park. Yeah, our grandkids love that thing. <laughs> they get up on it. Get up and stand on it, like you're surfing. Cute. It's all fun. Yeah, it's it's very popular. Um, we also put in a wildflower and grasses, uh, an art maze, and did a partnership with the Delaware County Library to have a poetry contest for um, and selected our poet and have um, uh, pavers that will have the poem engraved as you walk through the art maze and come to the, to the little art piece that was done by a couple in Prospect. Um, and so now we want to keep going. We, the, we want to fund the paver paths, so, um, the tree planters, the, the musical waterfall, um, the picnic tables were acquired from UDF when they tore that building down, so they gave those to us, and now we need to put a concrete pad to install them. Um, little X's you see on this chart are the art pieces, and we have grants in motion through National Endowment for the Arts and the Arts Council, as well as funding through um, um, other small community art uh, grants. Here's a picture of our musical waterfall. You can see that it, we have a piano from Paul Rockwell that has been donated um, and we have the trenching done for the water and the electricity and just need to kind of finish pulling that together and that'll be fun. So uh, to do the overall imagination space was $230,000 or so um, through uh, funding and in-kind donations we've funded 261000 We have over 20 in the bank and we need another 49,000 to get the rest done. And that's made up of um, the trenching. We've done the trenching and the irrigation. We need to run the, hook up the uh, plumbing, the electrical, finish the paver paths, put in tree planters and some concrete. So that's what it's like. Questions? Are you moving the unicorn from where it is? Pardon me? Are you moving the unicorn? The intention is to put it over. In the upper left corner on the street? Yes, Street? yeah. Um, we've had it added lighting, a solar lighting, and uh, cameras in that area. Um, I, I worry a little bit about vandalism. I kind of like her out there in front of the sails. She's very iconic and visible from, so I don't know. Uh, if not, we'll find another piece to go there. What are your priorities in the, uh, you mentioned the 49,000, uh, within that, uh, that uh, total, what are your, what are the most important things for the Well, I think park? the paver paths, um, we added ADA um, uh, parking along uh, and a ramp at the Winter Street entrance, um, and I'd like to make, connect that Winter Street entrance to the rest of the park. When we excavated the blacktop, you know, it's gravel now. So it, it's most important that we are able to get from that entrance area where there's a concrete pad mm -hmm. through the park into, to a couple of different key points, um, you know, so, so that people can stroll and push their strollers and the wheelchairs can get through mm -hmm. and people with canes aren't stumbling around. So that would be my priority. Yeah. Have you gotten an estimate for that, the paver path? Yes, I do. It's, it's in the material that I provide. It's in the, yeah. it's okay, thank yes, you. Yes, we have that. I have an estimate from Ryan's okay. Landscaping. Ryan's Landscaping has done all the paver paths to date, and we've had donations of pavers and um, gravel and other things that kind of help keep that, those costs under control. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but, you know, it's still, there's still costs. They don't, not everybody's willing to do it for free. Yeah. And keep going doing it for free, so. Okay. Do most of the users of it tend to be city residents of the park? Mm, I would say that's probably true, yes. I mean, there, a lot of people walk there. Um, so students from Ohio Wesleyan are there a lot of the time. Um, people in the community are walking in. But we see people drive in and, 
and park along uh, Catherine Street and Winter Street, and so they're coming in from further afield than they could just walk. Um, I do a lot of outreach to community groups like um, Kiwanis. I work with Kiwanis, and uh, I went to Burr Oak uh, a few weeks ago and did a presentation to them. And so I go and talk to them about it and invite them in to be volunteers um, and to, to participate in uh, our our programming and you know so I usually see them come back I, I invite them to do um, art projects I just took um, a series of birdhouses out to uh, big walnut schools and and then they came into the park and experienced it for the first time uh, we have Olin Tangi students that come in and do service projects about twice a year so we are seeing more outreach to <coughs> further reaches of the area any other questions no other questions. It's a fun place. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, nice, like nice use, and it's close to downtown and yeah. part of the community. So. Thank you. I appreciate it. Applaud your leadership on this. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you, Roxanne. Thank you. Okay. Next is uh, Destination Delaware. break these out now it's it's, <laughs> it's bad <laughs> yeah take your time all right sorry about that well, good, good morning thank you commissioners thank you for having us in today uh, Tim Wilson executive director of destination Delaware um, normally I think I'm here touting whatever new project we're working on or our 140 miles of sh shoreline miles and most in the state of Ohio, right? Uh, something new and exciting. Uh, but today we wanna talk a little bit about preserving some history. Um, as you know, uh, we have a one covered bridge left in Delaware County. Uh, it happens to be uh, on Chambers Road uh, in Porter Township, just off of uh, State Route 61. Um, and we're here today to talk about what we could do to preserve that in the long term. Uh, Bridge was built in 1874. An interesting gentleman, uh, Everett Sherman, uh, he actually built a bridge down at Stratford. Uh, it was his first bridge in county. I believe it was 1852 or something like that. Uh, if I, my memory serves me correct, I was down where the, uh, near where the uh, Chrysler, performance Chrysler dealership is. Uh, and uh, he moved up to, and we ended up building this uh, bridge. They consider it near Olive Green. Um, and it's uh, and a surviving example of the Child's Trust Bridge, which at the time uh, everyone was using uh, what they called a long, uh, a long uh, truss bridge, a gentleman design, which used wood shims. Uh, what's unique about this bridge in particular uh, is it uses iron appendages with bolts on each end. So rather than have to drive wedges in as the seasons change and the humidity changes, they were able to just to tighten the bolts. Uh, that may be why it's lasted so long, but uh, it's still in, in very good shape, as you know. So. So what we'd like to what we'd like to uh, ask you for today is some assistance. Um, we could come today and ask for aesthetic improvements. Uh, there's it's been vandalized. Some uh, the county engineer uh, has confirmed that it is in fact structurally sound. Uh, the wood in it is still in very good condition. Uh, it's it's passable by motor vehicle traffic as it's uh, marked. As you can see in the picture that I provided, it does have some vandalism. And that probably comes from the fact that it's on a quiet road in Porter Township and there's not a lot of lights and, you know, people, people do things like that on covered bridges. So what we, would like to, uh, what we would like to ask for help with today is getting electric and fiber optic service to the bridge. Um, that would help us, allow us to provide security lighting and webcams 
uh, in order to provide some security for the bridge before we do any aesthetic improvements. We feel like if we do aesthetic improvements, paint, uh, you know, anything like that, that it's just going to be vandalized once again. And, and the fact that we could have uh, additional lighting out there and some, uh, some webcam security uh, would help, you know, dissuade people from vandalizing the bridge. So uh, with that, I have with me today, um, set in the back here, Brad Everstall with Consolidated Electric, as you all know, uh, working with us on this project, and Joe Pemberton with Suburban Natural Gas, who has also been uh, a great asset and corporate partner. Uh, we're, working, we're, we're working diligently with several entities to bring in as many partners on this project as we can, including the high school, Big Walnut High School, uh, to see if we could do some kind of a school project each year with them uh, with regards to the bridge and uh, maybe a project, a, a bench, or some updates and uh, some aesthetic improvements. <clears throat> Uh, we're also uh, talking with uh, Chris Baker, the Community Foundation, uh, to create a fund or establish a fund for this bridge so that it can live on in perpetuity. And we feel like that's with, while this isn't the, pardon the, the expression, the sexiest project, uh, getting the electric and the fiber over there is going to ultimately contribute to its long-term viability. So with that, I'll take any questions or in my two associates as well as well. I'll, I'll go first. Yes, the, uh, you and I have already talked a little bit about this. I right. promise you I get out to see this bridge. I haven't done it yet, but I'll, <laughs> I'll try to do that over the holiday. You talked about security, mm -hmm. having cameras out there. If I'm going to vandalize the building, the, first, uh, the bridge, first thing I'm going to do is eliminate those cameras. Mm -hmm. I'm not, is that really going to be a viable option long term? Well, Sure. We feel like they'll be high enough on a, on a pole uh, that it won't be easily vandalized. I mean, at a certain point, uh, you know, someone's going to try to break into Fort Knox. That's just the way it goes. But we feel like this will certainly help discourage those folks that are, you know, we're not talking career criminals here. We're hopeful it's just kids that are bored, and then maybe this will discourage them from, you know, continuing to spray paint. It, what we've seen has just been, you know, spray painting all over the bridge with various and sundry phrases and whatnot. So. And I'm not asked the county engineer this question, but uh, uh, we're very proud of the fact that most of the bridges in our county have been replaced or improved. Mm -hmm. Is this bridge on the list for that? Is this going to remain a, a functional bridge? Is that your understanding? Because I've not asked the county engineer. Yes. In, in my uh, conversation with Engineer Bowserman, that was, it is a functional, viable, passable bridge, other than the height restrictions, obviously. No plans to replace it? Or not in, not, he did not mention that to me, no. And what are you asking for? Uh, we're asking for $25,000 uh, in order to run the, it's 4,000 feet in my red lamp run. Approximately, why don't you come up here and talk about the? Sure. Brad Ebersaw, Consolidated Cooperative. Uh, we do have electric in the near area uh, serving those areas, but unfortunately, those lines come to an end, so we would be extending the electric uh, from the last pole uh, location, which is approximately 4,000 feet. Um, we would do that. There's a, a few large trees, so we wanted to trench that service uh, in uh, along that area and then extend that fiber at the same time. Um, from a fiber perspective and a security perspective to answer uh, Commissioner Merrill's question in regards to that, the thought of being able to have fiber and, and webcams, you have the ability to capture the license plate number as well of those vehicles that would be there. Because it's out in the country that you have that opportunity to cap potentially capture any traffic that comes by, uh, be able to capture that license plate and kind of work backwards in regards to any vandalism that would occur. Uh, if those are on a pole, a, a lip pool um, height, those are going to re uh, reduce those uh, potential for uh, vandalizing the camera itself as well. But, uh, you know, general lights and security and a simple sign that uh, says 24-hour surveillance tends to uh, have teenagers find someplace else uh, to do their uh, vandalism um, in, in regards to it. But uh, from an electric and um, uh, fiber perspective, 
being able to extend that uh, just that minor distance is uh, within a, a viable amount and uh, as consolidated we're looking to help uh, do that as well um, putting some of our finances and labors towards that and donating towards this project knowing it, it that it's the last covered bridge in uh, Delaware County we'd like to find that preservation and it falls within our service territory so being a helpful uh, person to the county uh, in a and finding that preservation uh, for long-term viability is something that we're, we appreciate. Okay, any other questions? I have one last question. Tim, in your role in tourism, do you find yes, people come to this county to see this bridge for that reason, because it is the only one, or we're just hoping? There's, there is some traffic to see the bridge. I mean, it's listed. Uh, I was able to finally get the uh, the, the original filings from the U.S. Department of Interior just came in last night uh, in 1970, 1974 uh, when it was listed on the National Historic uh, Register. Uh, so the bridge is listed. I did get the packet. I'll happy to forward that to anybody. It's in electronically if, if you'd like to look at that. It's got some interesting facts. So yeah, it is, it is noteworthy from that standpoint and people do visit it. I think uh, with some additional marketing on our part uh, and again, we want it we want to make sure we're promoting something that exudes, you know, what we feel like about the county, not something that's been vandalized. Uh, and, you know, our high water mark in Delaware County was 64 covered bridges at one point. Uh, now we're down to one. So this is the last one. This is the last chance we get. And, yeah, we would like to, with the Ohio Erie Canal, uh, a lot of these kind of projects coming through with trails, um, yes, it, it's just going to continue to build uh, the, the interest from tourism. Uh, as well as you know, motorcycles, uh, people driving, traveling uh, up and down 61. It is very reachable. Uh, it's, it's not an out of way place. It's only a quarter mile, I believe, off of uh, 61. So it is very t accessible from the high state highway as far as that goes. One last question. And yes, sir. Once, uh, the theoretically, this was done, you have funding or will find funding for uh, getting rid of graffiti or whatever. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be coming back and asking for that from us? Correct. Correct. We, uh, we have, I mean, the engineer has even stated that, uh, there, you know, there is uh, funds available for bridge maintenance as well. So uh, anything as we repair that, uh, you know, can take care of some of the graffiti. But, yes, we will be, we will track down the funds to, to paint it, uh, to make it look nice or any additional projects. This is, this is the real challenge for us, though, going forward, is those efforts are kind of seen for all for naught if, you know, we can, we can paint it all we want. If they continue to vandalize it, we're never going to get past this. And we feel like this is the best means uh, to get there uh, and, and help secure it, to, you know, going forward. So. Okay. Thank you, Tim, Absolutely. very much. Uh, Tim, before you go, I, I yes, can sir. attest to local interest in the bridge because I, I remember going out there more than once as a teenager in college and everything. To vandalize too. it? Or? <laughs> <laughs> we did see some JBs carved in the bridge. Yeah, I don't, I think the statute of limitations has expired, but uh, you may find my initials carved in there somewhere. But, yeah, there's tons of initials. Obviously, if anything speaks to the, the popularity of the bridge is the amount of vandalism on it, and everybody seems to use a different color and, and extols whatever, whoever they're in love with this week on the bridge. We just appreciate if they would visit it, and you know, we, we hope to see you know, it, it become a real uh, stopping point for senior class pictures, prom pictures, wedding pictures. I mean, we're, Jane's in here still somewhere. And I suggested we have the state of the county address out there at some point, which I'm not sure how that's going to go. But, you know, um, but I, I think it's real asset. We have an Afghan hanging in our office that's got the Chambers Road Bridge on it. At, so, you know, there was, there's been enough interest in it in the past. Uh, people know it's here. Um, we just, we feel compelled to help uh, get it over this hurdle uh, and, and once we can bring some more uh, notoriety to it that uh, you know the the extra donations will pile in so yeah it is a neat bridge it, it is really it really is yeah it, and again I am happy to forward you uh, the historic register it's got like I said it has some interesting uh, parts of the engineering uh, in it that explains why it's relevant so if you'd like me to forward that to everyone thank you yep. absolutely thank you. Thank you. all right uh, next up we have habitat for humanity Todd Miller. Yes. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Here it is. Very good. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> My name's 
Todd Miller. I'm the Executive Director with Habitat for Humanity of Delaware and Union Counties. Uh, we applied for a uh, skid steer or a bobcat. Um, we're currently building our 77th affordable home in Delaware County, and we've been building four or five homes a year for the last few years. Um, we previously had a uh, bobcat, and uh, it's been, we think, about four years ago that uh, the seat caught fire, and that was the, the, the end of the line. We retired that uh, bobcat as it was costing us more money in repairs than, than anything else. Um, since that time, well, I'll start by saying we utilize a, a, a bobcat in three phases of, of every home we build. Um, in the clearing phase, uh, meaning pre-construction, um, we use it to infill the foundation, uh, and then we use it in the final grading. Um, we have not had a bobcat for three or four years. Uh, a new one costs around $90,000. Um, uh, we believe uh, we can get a very good used one for the around $25,000, which is what I asked for. We've been getting by with, we have one volunteer who owns one, and then the, uh, the uh, operator engineers union, who they dig all of our foundations for free for training uh, for their students for heavy machinery. Well, they also have been coming back with a bobcat to infill our foundations and then also do the final grading. The problem is we're at the mercy of their schedule and we often wait needlessly for weeks at a time to get like the final grading or, or the foundation infilled. Um, so as I said in my application um, for our grant request, um, owning a bobcat of our own again, um, would be a, a great asset to our efficiency and our ability to continue to build affordable homes in Delaware County. Okay, questions? How many days a year do you, would you actually use a bobcat? Um, I'd say if, if, if you broke it into days, probably three, two, two, seven days per home. So How many homes? Four to five. We've done so five. 25, each year. 30 days a year. Yeah. So. Wouldn't, wouldn't renting one be more economical than having a bobcat that sits idle most of the time? Well, it's difficult to get rentals these days, too. I mean, that's another problem with, with box trucks and our restores. We, we, you can't hardly get a, uh, a, a rental. Um, I mean, that would be for you to decide if, if us renting a bobcat would be better for us than the county donating $25,000 for us to own one. So you've looked into rentals? And we've tried, yeah. We, we, I mean, we're stretched for money as it is. I mean, we're mm -hmm. pro the cost of properties, the cost of home construction, they've all gone up dramatically over the last few years. So. Mm -hmm. um, I just know it's been difficult to find rentals, and we've relied on mostly the help of our volunteer and the union engineers, engineers union. How would you um, move the Bobcat around from site to site? On a trailer. You have a trailer? We don't currently, but we've owned a couple in the past, and, and trailers are a lot easier to come by. I think our construction manager owns a trailer personally. Okay. But when we've purchased trailers, we've had two that were stolen from us. Um, and we still don't know how the bobcat that we did own caught fire. It was sitting on a lot on High Street here in Delaware when it did. Um, but uh, um, you know, the, we've purchased trailers for a thousand dollars before. Mm -hmm. Wow! How how would you protect it then? It'd be parked in our our warehouse on Curtis Street. Okay. I mean, and and other than the times it would be on the build sites. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Thanks, Thank Bob. you very Thank much you for, for coming in. And our next uh, person. Yeah. At 11. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Do you want to go into recess? Or yes. Or?
uh, we'll recess then until 11. <laughs>